Okay, very good morning. It is Tuesday 17th of March. Uh, I think before I really kick things off, just a quick word first and foremost. Obviously, what we do at Amplify Trading and what we talk about on uh, our briefings is all market related, but that doesn't take away from the fact that you know, absolutely, first and foremost, this is a humanitarian issue um, and we'll try to be as sensitive as we can in regards to talking about this topic. Uh, obviously, it is what is driving markets at the moment, so uh, we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't talk about it. Um, but obviously, we send our sympathy to any of those affected by this issue, and, and hopefully all of our followers, you'll stay well, you, your friends, and your family going forward. But let's just push on and let's talk about what is moving markets this morning. And obviously, as I said, um, it is still this kind of screen that people are monitoring very closely and particularly that uh, the numbers that are mounting outside of China, uh, very similar pattern to what we've seen of late where the other location, i.e. the yellow line, is now sharply above the orange line, that being the flat lining we've seen in mainland China. Um, what has that led to? Well, yesterday, as I'm sure you saw, uh, quite unbelievable really, uh, getting down. Uh, I did have one of the new traders yesterday uh, talking to me about what happened in 2008 and he was asking me have we ever hit level two uh, in the price limits and I was <laughs> and actually I can't remember when we ever did uh, in terms of level two level two being 13 percent when stock markets are actually active on the on the floor uh, but yesterday we actually did get down to those those types of levels uh, the S&P actually plunged about 12 percent uh, the biggest one day fall then it outweighed some of the moves we had last week, uh, biggest one day fall since Black Monday, of course, in October of 1987. Um, the main thing here is not, is not so much the fact that more confirmed cases and deaths are happening around the world. It's now the economic reality, I guess, of uh, countries tightening restrictions on public movement in order to curb the spreading of the virus, which is causing uh, the most reaction if you like in markets and we certainly saw that yesterday if we look at um, the actual this is a, a heat map of the S&P 500 uh, and as you can see it's a, an absolute sea of red some of the biggest tech giants Microsoft were down about 15 percent some of the big uh, money center banks in the financial sector down about 15 percent for JP uh, Bank of America Wells Fargo um, however what was I thought um, quite interesting. There's, there is actually a couple of spots of green on the otherwise completely red heat map and I think it's quite telling from a uh, reaction effects to how sectors have been moving in response to the coronavirus. So the companies that actually moved higher yesterday despite one of the biggest down days in history was the world's biggest gold miner, Newmont Corporation, was JM Schmucker Company which is basically processed and packaged food, and then Clorox, which is the bleach company. So basically cleaning companies, gold, and packaged processed food companies uh, outperforming, as you would probably imagine in these types of uh, times when there's been lots of global stockpiling by consumers fearful of uh, the worst and complete national uh, shutdowns in that respect. So. With this, um, what has it led to? Well, there's quite a few people um, now talking about potential uh, short selling bans, about even the prospects of just shutting the stock exchange for a couple of weeks. You know, the thing about a virus, of course, is that a virus naturally, once enough people have been infected, the virus has no one else then to infect. And so therefore, naturally, you get this kind of bell shape where then once we go over a critical point, cases then start to decrease. Uh, hence the thinking of the UK government before, which was quite brash and obviously had a negative public reaction, was that everyone should go about their business and get infected because the quicker that happens, the quicker we can bounce back. Uh, that, in theory, makes sense. But obviously the practicality of that is that we're talking about human loss of life here. So. Uh, and this is why someone like Boris Johnson obviously has changed tact quite severely. Yesterday, uh, the UK Prime Minister said that we should avoid offices 
pubs and traveling, uh, particularly if it's non-critical, this kind of idea of uh, not having any mass gatherings. Uh, the Trump administration, what did they say yesterday? Well, that they're not currently considering a national lockdown like what we've had uh, in Italy or in Spain, for example. Uh, they are looking at certain regions uh, in terms of where they're suggested is the worst areas of the outbreak that they might take specific measures. Remember, we spoke yesterday about New York and uh, LA, for example, shutting down restaurants only for takeaway business. Um, however, he did say something quite interesting, Trump, in that the outbreak could be over by July, August, perhaps even later. Uh, and so this, I think, as well, is what's uh, providing this continuous kind of downside weight on markets is this idea that you know this is becoming a much more long-term protracted issue than perhaps a, f a few people were thinking just a week or two ago you know this this idea as we've mentioned before about this v-shaped recovery turning to u-shape turning to something more kind of akin to the financial crisis l-shaped if you like is, is kind of we're going through the alphabet slightly in terms of how quickly people think we can return to some degree of normality and I think what was very important was yesterday you remember I showed you that graphic of the almost catastrophic drop-off in Chinese economic data and this is what Goldman Sachs have said they've revised and obviously they've become quite bearish remember they were putting out a call for 2000 in the S&P uh, as their ultimate kind of low in the most bearish scenario um, they've said that they've cut their Q1 GDP estimate for China to a contraction of 9%. That's from a revised call where they previously brought that down to a still growth of 2.5%. So that's a, that's a meaningful uh, and sizable in history would be one of the biggest drops ever um, that we would have seen. And so, yeah, it's these sorts of things, you know, China being that far ahead of the curve in terms of the impact and, uh, and the fact that in, in mainland Europe and basically everywhere else in the globe, things are set to get much worse, uh, would suggest then that this is, this is the reality. And, and think certainly what hit home at the weekend, I had a number of calls off uh, a few of my close friends, particularly back from my school days, who perhaps I haven't spoken to in a while, but they're obviously aware of what I do as a job. And they were asking me about the likelihood of them losing their jobs and how bad is the recession going to be. You know, and this is the real reality the tangible impact that this coronavirus is ultimately going to have and uh, and this is why we're seeing such a uh, a grave weight in markets in this continuous kind of large scale market movement i mean just to put it into some perspective um, this is the s p 500 and it's looking at the daily percentage price changes and the s p 500 has risen or fallen at least 4% for basically six days in a row. Um, and the only time I can really remember in, in my career is back in uh, the kind of depths of 2008 when the market was kind of moving in, in such a fashion. Um, to give you some idea though, uh, of what's been happening and how people have been trying to counteract this in the marketplace, well, for one, we've had central banks and yes, the Fed, and other central banks have taken, taken kind of coordinated action to lower interest rates back to zero in the case of the US, of course. They've restarted quantitative easing. The other thing that they've been looking at is this, is the, the dollar swap lines. This is another form of the Federal Reserve and uh, teaming up with the other world's largest central banks like the Bank of England, the ECB or the BOJ is looking to make sure that we don't get what we had in the financial crisis, which is a complete loss of confidence in the system, which led to an ultimate credit crunch. And that's what was kind of what is at this point at least slightly different. That was a financial crisis. This is more of an economic crisis at this point. Uh, but last night you had Japanese banks tap the Fed's beefed up swap lines for $32 uh, billion. Now that actually um, is a good thing for a case of liquidity if that was a key systemic risk to the system. The fact that these are, and this is what they're meant for, is to counteract any of those potential um, kind of freezes on liquidity like what we had back in, what, September time of last year when we first started to see those episodes of repo rate spikes and obviously the Fed have been very active there. Now this is happening and this is quite crucial and I actually think that this is uh, perhaps, although I don't think we're over the worst in terms of the equity route, 
Uh, these are positive signs that have been seeing on the ground. And if anything, I think the, the bond market perhaps a little less uh, sensitive to what we've been seeing in the equity market. And perhaps that's a reflection of some of these uh, other tools, if you like, kicking in. Um, the other thing then is uh, banning of short selling. And I've had a few questions on this. Now, banning of short selling did happen in the global financial crisis. I think it was in the autumn of 2008 when it was really all kicking off at the time. Uh, that led to temporary short selling ban and restrictions in the likes of the US, the UK, Germany and others. Um, generally then, what this has led to is Spain, Italy have followed suit. It's not particularly uncommon for countries like Italy and their consob to ban short selling. Uh, just given the volatility that they've experienced in their local market really ever since not just the financial crisis but the European sovereign crisis as well um, of kind of the 2010 to 2012 era um, but this is another I guess countermeasure to stop the, a, a persistent breakdown in markets that we have been seeing I mean they are temporary in nature uh, are very unusual that they would be long lasting given the kind of uh, the kind of free market nature of, of movement that we're most used to seeing as a natural ability for, for people to be out of short. But obviously, this is something that gets adopted in likes of China for a long time. Uh, so it's not massively uncommon. Um, I wouldn't say this is the sole reason of why we've bounced this morning. I mean, if we actually look at the actual charts, uh, looking at the DAX center left, the NASDAQ and the S&P, well, US index futures are actually limit up. Um, that means, remember, outside of cash trading hours, you have a 5% kind of circuit breaker either side in uh, Globex electronic trade, where until markets open in New York, then it resets to the 7, 13, 20% price limits. So we got there pretty quick overnight. In fact, in the Asia Pacific session, it's a case of the NASDAQ, and we, had it, we got there pretty quick as well in the same case of the other uh, major US indices. But I'd say this is very... Um, common when a market overextends by the tune of 12, maybe 13% in the case of the Dow, a natural bounce back of uh, multiple percentage points is not uncommon. Remember, we did see this on Thursday night going into Friday, only then for the market to, to fall over again. And so definitely, I wouldn't read too much uh, into it at this point. I still think that overall, this, this period of volatility is here to stay for the time being. And I still think that the way these governments have been acting at the moment, uh, further, more onerous kind of quarantined measures are somewhat inevitable. And that is only going to um, amplify the impact of the economic damage that's going to have to be priced into markets. So I do think uh, there is somewhat worse to come for the, for the equity market. Um, however, as I said, we have bounced a little bit from the overnight session. Uh, Australia's stock market was up over 5% after plunging nearly 10% a day earlier. It's the biggest rise, in fact, seen in the Australian market since 1997. Uh, Australian regulators have also, yesterday, they were telling traders in the country's equity markets that they'd have to trade significantly less in order to stop this kind of excessive uh, volatility. So, yeah, at the moment, it almost feels like we're in a bit of a, a holding pattern, perhaps, slight pause for breath but I do think it's literally that and that when we exhale to use that analogy I think we're in for another perhaps quite bumpy day ahead and I don't think this week is going to be without uh, its multiple percentage point moves again uh, so with that I'm going to have a quick review of the calendar and to stress not that I think that the calendar is particularly important because any economic data now is nigh on useless in terms of what it means really from an economic and monetary policy reaction. It is so dwarfed by now the period and the challenge that world economies face going ahead that you know economic data that inherently majority is backward looking in, in terms of hard data is really of no consequence. So we're going to get things like the average earnings numbers coming out of the UK, the unemployment rate coming out. Uh, these are January figures. As I said, I would not anticipate these to move the currency market. Uh, German ZEW uh, sentiment, that could be interesting. Uh, this is economists and analysts kind of current and six months forward looking expectations of the future. 
and to just just to get it and quantify the impact of how bearish have they become in their views uh, that, that that soft data certainly is much more telling in this current point in time uh, re u.s retail sales in february probably not going to capture this latest uh, kind of escalation than what we've seen particularly uh, for u.s consumers uh, and also the move that we've seen from the from the u.s administration of late um, so again it's Probably something to be aware of, but maybe not the, the, the definitive factor for the session. Same case really goes for the industrial production cap utilization later on from the US and business infantries. Um, all more focused then on just a bigger, broader um, picture at play. All right. Um, Sam, come on, and uh, he can have a chat as well on a few levels. But uh, if there's any comments, of course, just let me know in the chat room. And I'll be happy to address those as we go throughout the day. Otherwise, I'm going to wish you a great day ahead. Thanks very much.